the city of St. Louis, you're listening to the Don't Push Pause podcast with your hosts, Justin Johnson and Lindsay Reber. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome back, everyone. Happy almost Halloween, Justin. Yeah, happy almost Halloween. It is October, our favorite month of the year. And normally we do multiple horror movie episodes in October. And we've been doing it for five years. And we've come to the realization that because we try to load up with so many episodes for October, we end up getting all stressed out and not enjoying watching horror movies and, mm-hmm. and taking in all the fun of October. And we, we wised up this year and we're only releasing one episode for October, one horror movie. Um, but for those of you who are like, wait a minute, that's hold on a sucks. Second. You know, <laughs> I love, I love hearing about horror movies. Fear not. We are going to come back strong in December. The exorcist, which is going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary. So, I know we're only giving you one for October, but we've got more horror coming down the pike in December. Exorcist, what a great holiday, Christmas holiday movie. It's what I watch with the whole family, you know. Our feature this month, so we're doing Evil Dead 2. Yeah, and it's strange, you know, it's like researching this movie. Some people call it a direct sequel. Uh, Some people say, well, it's sort of a sequel. Uh, You know, they didn't want to, like confuse audiences even some of the people that worked on the movie yeah Um, but truth is there was like a rights issue like they didn't have the rights to evil dead one so when they made evil dead two they had to sort of redo it and it's a it seems like a condensed version of the original evil dead but more of an emphasis on special effects and black humor and we'll get into all that but it to me it's different enough to warrant not only a full episode on it, but I've had a lot of history watching these movies over the last like 30 something years and probably on any given like three or four year cycle. If you pulled me aside and said, which one is your favorite Evil Dead, Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness? My answer would be different. Um, currently, right now, my answer is the original Evil Dead. OK, um, okay. but. I think for the longest amount of time in my life, Evil Dead 2 has always been my go to. That was my favorite. Um, there was a while where. Army Darkness was new to me, and I saw it in theaters when it came out, and that was my favorite for a long time. But I do think Evil Dead 2 shared the longest amount of time as my favorite because this movie is so inventive, it's so crazy, it's so manic, and it really is when i was been watching it the last few weeks. It just has such a breakneck pace that you don't really even get time to get scared because it never lets up and never lets you catch your breath. I mean, I believe from the opening credits to Ash cutting off his girlfriend's head is six minutes into the movie. Um, so they've really taken the first Evil Dead, and you know this is called Evil Dead 2, but they've condensed the first Evil Dead down, and this movie just moves at the speed of light. Yeah, I think it is important, and a lot of horror movies, especially in this time period, to also not look too closely uh, as far as continuity if we're following a, a, a sequel. I mean, really, Ash's sister died in the first one and like there's no reason for ash to return to the cabin again unless you know you can make an excuse like okay he didn't die at the end of evil dead one he was possessed and then we come back and he's some like you can you can make up whatever story you want to make this a sequel i like the idea of the first one kind of being condensed at the beginning of evil dead 2 for an audience that maybe hadn't seen the first one that makes a lot more sense to me yeah I love that not only have we done the first Evil Dead, that was episode 84, but that doing Evil Dead 2, it's not like the first one, kind of the same reason that we did Alien and Aliens. They're part of the same franchise, but two totally different movies. And yeah, and we're going to talk a lot about Evil Dead 2 here. We're not going to focus on the events of Evil Dead 1 or really the Sam Raimi's early life. If you want to hear all that, we did such a big chunk of that in our Evil Dead Uh, episode like you said episode 84 so if you want i i would almost like say if you like the evil dead series listen to our first evil dead episode and then go into this one you know i was texting you the other day like oh man how do we 
make it interesting to talk about special effects because it's such a visual thing. Um, but I'd like to try to spend a little extra time on it for this episode because there are so many interesting aspects of what went into a movie of this small budget. And when you're watching this movie, you're like, oh my gosh, the whole thing is an effect. You know, there's like a sight gag or an effect. Like every scene, it just keeps like getting growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And a lot of like in-camera work, a lot of practical effects. So we'll, we'll get into that in our second discussion, but we will cover like the making of this movie. And of course we will talk about Sam Raimi, Rob Tapper, Bruce Campbell. Um, they continued on their relationship uh, working together and being producing partners like they did on the first one. And so there's a lot of good background information. And then also, you know, Bruce Campbell putting himself through a lot of punishment, uh, making another Evil Dead movie and continuing to grow the character of Ash Williams. I'm sure we'll hit on the rest of the cast as well, but we'll kick things off talking about how the sequel came to fruition, the writing. I'd like to talk a little bit about the location, and um, it's pretty special and wasn't the only movie that was made at that location as well. Kind of can't wait to dig into Evil Dead 2. Yeah. And then uh, we'll we'll spend a little, we, we did a little bit in our first Evil Dead episode, but we'll talk a little bit about the continuation of the Evil Dead characters, because since we've recorded our last Evil Dead episode, there's been a new Evil Dead film that has oh, been yeah. released that we both saw. So we'll talk a little bit about that too. I would also like to talk about Sarah Barry, who plays Annie Noby. I need to talk about her scream in this movie. Yeah, you were texting me about this scream, and uh, we, we'll, we'll definitely have a discussion about it. I have a lot of feelings on it. Well, Lindsay, what was your pick of the week for, well, you know, we, we try to stick with our uh, scary movies for October. I went with a Bruce Campbell movie, but what'd you, what'd you do? You know, I didn't do a Bruce Campbell movie. Um, I know, it's kind of sacrilegious. But I did go with a film whose lead actor, I think, resembles Bruce Campbell a lot which also contains stop motion animation. And there's so much of that in Evil Dead. I went with a movie that I love called Brain Damage. Ooh, that's a nice pick. It, it's um, it's one of the one of my favorites, one of my secret favorites. A lot of uh, like gooey special effects in that one too. Lots of gooey, yeah. There's, I mean, there's much more stop motion in Evil Dead, but this movie is very memorable to me. Yeah. And what about you? So I went with Don Coscarelli's Bubba Hotep starring Bruce Campbell as Elvis and Ossie Davis plays JFK or they think that they're these characters. They're in a retirement home and there's a mummy that's on the loose that's uh, sucking the souls of the uh, retirement community. And I thought this was a really nice pairing with Evil Dead 2 because you see there's such a difference in the style of these two movies, even though Bruce Campbell's presence is like so... Um, strong in both of these films. Bubba Hotep is such a slower paced movie and it really breathes. But it's also, you can tell that they're it's a low budget, but they're trying to be as creative as possible. And there's some really interesting creature effects. Wow, the performance of Bruce Campbell in this is pretty impressive. If you haven't seen Bubba Hotep, um, I highly suggest checking it out soon. I thought I had seen it. And after your brief description here, I've yeah, it's not familiar. Well, as always, we're going to round things out with our Murray moment after our picks of the week. And I always uh, can't wait to hear what you're going to do to relate uh, Bill Murray to Evil Dead 2. I never know how you're going to do it, but somehow you manage it. You, you you find some sort of narrative drive there. It really is an art form. Before we go to our first clip from Evil Dead 2, which is probably just going to be people screaming and making a lot of noises. Does Ash even have any dialogue yeah. in this movie? This is going to be the toughest episode to pull uh, <laughs> dialogue clips from. I think I had that problem with the yes. first Evil Dead. Yes, you did. Um, but uh, before we get into it, either way, Lindsay, can you give us your uh, quick interpretation, your condensed version of what this movie's about? Well, for whatever reason that we choose to believe and not quite matching up with what happened at the end of Evil Dead, Ash Williams returns to a remote cabin for a little getaway with his girlfriend, Linda. Soon into their stay, they discovered disturbing evidence of a demon-possessed book as found by a college professor and researcher. Ash and Linda play an audio tape of the researcher reciting pages from this Book of the Dead, which in turn possesses Linda and sends Ash into a battle for his life. With Ash losing his mind and a high probability of becoming possessed himself, the daughter of the researcher is on her way out to the cabin to further investigate this Book of the Dead. And after running into a few locals, the gang heads out to the cabin, 
only to find that all hell is broken loose and the evil spirits are, again, ruling the night. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Well, let's go to our first clip from Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> Even now we have your darling Linda soul. She suffers in torment. You're going down. Chainsaw. You know, Justin, I was trying to convince a friend of mine to watch evil dead one and two back to back and she was like oh i don't really like horror movies i'm like okay well the first one i mean the the makeup come on i mean you can get over it it's it's it is scary but like you can get over it but the second one the second one's a party movie this is what you show at sleepovers this is what you have on in the background at a party or you go to a party to watch evil dead 2 you don't really put on the first one for that but that's what makes this one stand out and what makes it like so much more epic yeah i couldn't agree more a party movie is a great way to put it in the last probably like 10 or 15 years of my life i've shown evil dead 2 to a group either like at a screening that i put together or backyard screening i did one outside god (laughs) i did a few inside i did one at a bar myself i've been to like multiple screenings of evil dead 2 in different places i saw it at a drive-in a couple years ago with bruce campbell live in person and the crowd reaction to this movie whether people have seen it or not is always like something that you know is really going to uh get a crowd riled up and it's just again goes nonstop for like 86 minutes evil dead one you know there's a lot of quiet moments and there's only a few quiet moments that are purposely placed in evil dead two the rest is like wall to wall like craziness and sound it's so loud and yeah screaming yeah. chainsaws 30 something years later this movie still is a group movie i mean it's fun to watch by myself but it's nowhere near as fun as if i've got a couple people over and I'm like oh let's screw it let's put on evil dead two yeah it still has that young energy that the first one had but now this crew has a ton of money or at least you know 10 times the amount of money that they had before to do everything that they wanted to do with the first one you know with evil dead we talked so much about i mean sam raimi was 1920 when he was finishing the first evil dead and this one you know he's got a little bit of experience you know he made one movie for a studio that crime wave which really resulted in him uh being disappointed and not his vision not being shown you know they massacred his movie like recut it recast it and so i think evil dead 2 we double down on Raimi's talent we see what he can do how creative he can get with the camera work but not just that the situations in which he creates and you know bringing a crew and to do special effects and knowing what he wants and creature effects and bringing this uh, making this evil demonic like being entity come to life you know and again using the camera to suggest things to an audience but it's on a much bigger scale and you know the, they didn't have a ton, huge budget but a big enough budget to you know have a location that wasn't uh you know a cabin that they had to dig the basement out of themselves yeah. you know and they had a production a bigger production crew great cinematographer uh peter deming who you know we'll talk about later but went on to you know work with david lynch and shoot other big movies for sam raimi and you can see the advancement in his talent and his technique in this movie it's no wonder that once evil dead 2 came out he was able to build off of that movie and get a huge budget to do not only do a sequel to Evil Dead 2, but also do like Dark Man and start working for Universal Studios. But this movie, you know, it's much like the first Evil Dead. The the makings of Evil Dead 2 started where Raimi didn't know what he was going to do. He got kind of like put through the ringer with the studio system and didn't really know what his next move was. And it's crazy to think that, you know, he made a a studio picture as a second movie written by the Coen brothers and that movie was like such a disaster that he kind of disowns it. He doesn't even like to talk about that movie. And then, you know, this idea of, well, why don't you take your first movie and make a bigger version of it, make a sequel to Evil Dead because people know you from that. And that didn't seem like an idea that Sam Raimi wanted to do. He 
wanted to make other movies and he wasn't a horror movie guy. That's the thing that is so crazy to me is that, you know, you associate him so much with horror, but he wasn't even really a guy that likes horror movies. It just became one of those things where it's just like, well, I want to make a movie really badly and this is the path that I have to take. And so inevitably ends up doing the same thing that they did with Evil Dead 1. They make a horror movie because they can get the financing and they can make a profit. And like you said, Sam Raimi, Rob Tappert, and, and Bruce Campbell, I might just refer to them as the boys That's because it's always this trio of guys who are selling everything Evil Dead. They weren't really in the market to want to continue in the horror vein, but it was at the behest of Irvin Shapiro, who was their original sales agent with Evil Dead 1, actually changed the title of the movie to Evil Dead. It was at his behest that they should really consider making a sequel. And while they did think about it, um, Sam and Rob thought, okay, let's try with Crime Wave. Let's go on with that and see what happens. Hopefully we can, um, you know, they were kind of banking on it being a huge hit or hoping that it would be a huge hit. But they did give some idea to doing uh, Evil Dead 2. So Sam, along with another screenwriter at the time, Sheldon Littich, came up with a concept of Ash being sucked into a time portal in the Middle Ages. Um, he meets more deadites, like that sort of thing. Shapiro thinks that this is a promising idea, but with Crime Wave, um, they kind of put this idea on the shelf. Shapiro tried to sell the idea to 20th Century Fox and Universal, who both passed on it. So it didn't seem very promising. Let's see what happens with Crime Wave. Well, Crime Wave tanked. Um, kind of don't, like you said, Sam doesn't like to really talk about it. And both Sam and Rob thought, okay, we really need to think about Evil Dead 2 because this is Shapiro giving us another chance at getting a movie made. So they do tentatively have an idea for a script. They try to get involved with um, another company, Embassy Pictures, and a few others along the way, but everyone keeps kind of stalling them out. And after four or five months of stalling out and no progress being made, they kind of just start to interview potential crew members and cast on their own and thinking, okay, we're just going to go at this even if we don't have a company behind us right now. And I can understand uh, some of these production companies' apprehension. I'm always playing the devil's advocate uh, when it comes to you know armchair quarterbacking on what, what people should have <laughs> done in the movie industry yeah, that course. I know nothing about. Uh, but I can understand in some ways because generally when – sequels come out for horror movies i mean it's usually like less than a year they've got the sequel out the door like in in theaters and evil dead one had been out for like you know two or three years crime wave was not a success so sam raimi had a movie that was successful like three or four years ago so there wasn't that immediate like clamoring for a sequel whereas now i feel like it's almost any movie if it does even remote business at the box office as soon as it's a success like you'll see in the trades like a sequel has been announced you know like we just saw it with the uh success of like scream 5 it was like as soon as that was a huge hit they're like oh now we're gonna see scream 6 and so yeah too much time maybe had passed that studios were like eh, i don't know are people really wanting an evil dead sequel but nonetheless it still ended up being a commodity for uh, some people in the uh, business they saw a uh, profit potential in doing a sequel to Evil Dead. And this is kind of where we enter with film producer Dino De Laurentiis. Now, Dino had previously approached Sam about wanting to direct Thinner since he had been on kind of a kick of producing a lot of Stephen King stories. He did The Dead Zone, Cat's Eye, later on Silver Bullet, um, and around this time, Maximum Overdrive. And this is where Stephen King yet again steps into the Evil Dead universe and helps out this trio, this production crew, um, who are determined to continue on with this franchise. So Stephen King is having dinner with a potential Evil Dead 2 crew member. Uh, as I said before, Sam and the boys were interviewing folks to hopefully get this production off the ground. And Stephen King was having dinner with one of these people and asked what else they had been working on. And they mentioned Evil Dead 2, but said that Sam was having trouble getting some financing. It's no secret that Stephen King was the reason that Evil Dead rose to popularity. Justin, what was his uh, movie review? What did he like say? They used it for the poster. He called yeah. it one of the most ferociously original horror movies. Yeah, and that's what helped sell Evil Dead. It's kind of incredible. King at this time was directing Maximum Overdrive, which was a Dino De Laurentiis movie. So he's in regular contact with him, and he contacts him about doing Evil Dead 2 and suggests he should really consider producing this film. 
Dina was skeptical about financing the sequel, but as soon as the Evil Dead boys showed him the grosses from Evil Dead 1 and how much that movie had made on, on a nothing budget, he jumped on board. So this was in December of 1985. And at this point, Dino's on board and says, you guys go down to North Carolina. I've got a studio down there and we've, you know, we've got this done. Let's just get it going. At Dino's studio in North Carolina was also where Maximum Overdrive was being filmed. It kind of just made sense to him as far as these two movies that I'm producing, why not have them at the same studio? Sam and the boys weren't exactly the most fond of the idea of being that close to the producer and thought that there's a way that they can do things a little bit cheaper and maybe cut some corners and look for their own location. Dino wasn't exactly happy about the idea, but as soon as they found um, Wadesboro, North Carolina, it was about three hours, I think, from Wilmington. Dino went along with the idea. He wasn't, like I said, too fond of it. And he, I think, even asked, how long's the drive? And as soon as he expressed hesitation about it being too long, the boys were like, okay, cool. He's not going to ever visit the set. Great. Dino was always about the money, understandably. He's the producer. So if they're able to make things happen a little bit cheaper, it sounded good in his mind. And it was a smart move on Dino's part because uh, flash forward real quickly to the first day of production, uh, Rob Tappert, producer, uh, told the cast and crew, like, hey, guys, we're already in profit. Uh, Dino De Laurentiis was able to pre-sell the rights to Evil Dead 2 overseas for more than what the budget was. So that had to be exhilarating. Uh, on Evil Dead 1, they're, like, putting stuff on credit cards and begging and asking people for money and on this one your first day of production where you have a decent budget to get done what you want to get done you're already in profit has got to be a much more comforting way to start production on a film especially a low budget one i could see how some people would feel pressure by that like oh we've really got to produce something but i bet sam raimi was stoked about it because he's just a really inventive creative guy and the having money to complete your wild visions um yeah it had to be a really freeing experience and knowing you're not going to have an executive producer like breathing down your neck because they're already making money already Mm -hmm. before you've even made the film yeah um but uh let's get into the actual uh just now we'll jump back a little bit and talk about the development of the script for evil dead 2 if you've seen evil dead 2 many times you know there's not a heck of a lot of dialogue in this thing it's very similar to the first one where a lot of the time we were just spent with ash in the cabin by himself so he's not really communicating with anybody i mean he's like screaming and hollering and maybe says one or a few things to himself but for the most part there's not a ton of back and forth dialogue exchange so sam first started writing this when he lived with joel and ethan cohen and holly hunter kathy bates and a podcast favorite here francis mcdormand it really like blows my mind that those creative minds were living under the same roof So Sam starts writing there, but there are too many distractions, understandably. So Sam taps his old friend from Evil Dead 1, Scott Spiegel, to help him co-write the script. Their intentions were pretty much to try to revisit Evil Dead a little bit. Dino did not want this idea that Sam had previously thought of, of going into the Middle Ages. He vetoed that idea. He wanted them back in the cabin. So Sam and Scott wanted to make this wackier, weirder version of Evil Dead 1. And if you haven't listened to our Evil Dead episode, Scott Spiegel was longtime friends with all of these guys and was from Michigan, grew up with them, and he had made shorts with Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell, and one of those shorts was called The Helping Hand. And if you're a fan of or aware of Hamburger Helper, on the box there was like, in the old days, there was this like hand that had a face on it that talked and they did a short film where that hand becomes evil, but it was like a comedy. And so that was this sort of idea extension to evil dead, especially with the hand that, you know, when he chops his hand off and it's like making all that noise and it becomes alive was kind of directly lifted from the Scott Spiegel short. And so with these two together, they made the tone of evil dead much different than the original you know, one element I'm glad that they eliminated from the script was that that hand was going to have a cape at some point. Yes. It's a little too jokey. They didn't go too far with it. And I think Rob Tappert was always in on these things to, to say, okay, guys, it's a little 
little too goofy. Let's dial it back a little bit. Scott was the idea man. He had a lot of ideas, a lot of suggestions, and Sam was the visionary. One intention Scott had was to bring logic to the plot, which I don't know if there's necessarily a ton of logic to Evil Dead 2, but if you don't look too deep, I mean, it definitely follows like a perfect narrative plot line. And to also bring up a few rules of possession for this evil force. Again, it, it seems to work for everybody else except Ash, that, you know, once you're possessed, you're dead, like the evil force has killed you and you're possessed. Ash seems to come in and out of possession in this sequel. But one thing we definitely know for sure is that sunlight cures the possessed person. So that's one thing that we can hold on to. A lot of other ideas that they had were abandoned, but there was a lot of support to continue on with humor integrated into the plot. Also, too, with the, you know, we mentioned this in the beginning that, you know, they didn't have the rights to Evil Dead, so they had to kind of condense things to sort of make this uh, quote-unquote sequel, you know, reimagination um, on a bigger scale, but also still be able to call it Evil Dead 2, um, which I'm sure when this came out confused a lot of people who saw the first one because they're like, wait, is what's happening? He's going back out here. He's would not with a group of people. There's no mention of any of this stuff. He yeah. sees a tape recorder and it's like, he's seen it for the first time. <laughs> so, you know, they, they kind of just were like, Hey, we, we just have to do this thing. You know, we got to get them there into the cabin. So stuff moves along pretty quickly um, with the discovering of the cassette within the first like three minutes of the movie, he's already playing it. The demon's already moving toward the cabin and ready to possess uh, his girlfriend. I mean, it is pretty much Ash and someone go to a cabin. They find the Book of the Dead. The book possesses friend and then Ash learns how to defeat the evil. But I think in this movie, immediately what we see that's different is the uh, the chopping off Linda's head but then putting it in the vice and he has a chainsaw (laughs) or he goes to grab the chainsaw and the chainsaw's gone. And then you see her corpse come in with the chainsaw in its hand and it gets falls back onto the body and it's like moving around and the, the head is cutting it down the middle. The chainsaw scream at the head is screaming at Ash. He's screaming. He's getting stuff all over his face. It's right away we see the tone of this movie is totally different. And from that point on, it's just relentless. And I think the first Evil Dead is pretty relentless in its tension and violence. And I think this one is more relentless in its, I don't think it's slapsticky, but these sort of uh, manic episodes of like Ash, like getting either pulverized or like beaten up by the people that show up at the cabin, him beating himself up, him getting beat up by, a, a demon. I mean, it's just pretty much nonstop him taking abuse for 85 minutes. There's one thing that sets this movie apart from other horror comedies that there's no like jokey jokes. There's no knee slapper moments, not really any lines of dialogue that are intended for, you know, a laugh. It, they might get a laugh, but it's not really like a, a one liner type of joke. And to me, As much as I can identify the comedic elements in the film, I still get freaked out. I still get like, I see the legit scares in in Evil Dead 2, and I like that. It's this idea of funhouse horror. Uh, It's sick and twisted, just this level of insanity and instability that make the audience feel like they have no idea what to expect next. I laugh at the moments of when Annie is dragging Dan Hicks's character who has the sword, you know, through his chest when she's dragging him and he's like screaming because it hurts that she tells him to shut up. Like, I laugh at that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I laugh at the eyeball and the mouth part, too. It's like stuff that it's so ridiculous. It's like so ridiculous and gross. You know, you kind of have to laugh. At the same time, is it being funny? It's also horrifying when you think about it in the context of being in a horror movie. So, I mean, the I think it's easy to mix comedy and horror. It's not for everybody. It's certainly been done differently, like knee slapper type jokes yeah. and other horror comedies. I think those are the ones that when people say, I don't really like horror comedies, that's what they're talking about. Horror and comedy mix really well together for me because you sometimes you laugh at things that are really uncomfortable. Yeah. And so it just kind of works together. When watching this movie much older than I was when I embraced this film. 
uh, one of the most horrific parts of this whole movie to me when I'm watching it now is that uh, Ash is just like beaten to a pulp and all this crazy stuff has happened to him. And then these people arrive and then they kick the shit out of him yeah. and then toss him <laughs> into a cellar, which he knows that there's something down there. And then, uh, you know, the, it's like the, the line, uh, I hope you rot down there and like spits on him. And then you just see the door slam shut on him and he's just trapped down here with these people that have just abused him even further. Uh, that to me now, when I watch is like, oof, that's rough. But again, right after that coming in with like, that is brutal to watch not funny and then right after that ash is faced with this corpse that's coming up out of the cellar like it's yeah. not funny it's genuinely a nail-biting moment for me yeah i think the henrietta creature is one of the scariest out of all of the creatures of this trilogy i can't wait till we talk about effects we'll get to henrietta yeah we'll start talking about production soon and discussion too but i want to take a moment to say so bruce campbell you know star of evil dead he was given just a tiny role in crime wave he was originally supposed to play the lead and the studio went against Raimi, and they got someone else to play the lead and campbell just had a tiny role in it well with evil dead 2 he was going to be the star but he wanted to really be involved in it and he came on as producer and so there's a lot of the producer issues that um were taken care of by rob tabra but also bruce campbell all the way down to getting permission to use the school for the location they end up going to wadesboro north carolina to shoot evil dead 2 they needed this uh, school gymnasium that they could build the inner part of the cabin and that way they could, you know, do cooler camera shots. They could do above shots, not actually shooting in a decrepit cabin like they did the original one. And so Bruce Campbell did a, you know, went to the school board, talked to them, facilitated them securing those locations and trying to facilitate how they, they could get gear and how they could get more crew. And so had a bigger hand in that. And then also communicating with everybody in the town, anyone who could build a rig or had a company that did this, you know, he brought them in to help out on the production, you know, where everybody got paid and the town was happy that there was a movie shooting there. And coincidentally, that location in North Carolina was really only about a five hour drive from where they shot the first Evil Dead in rural Tennessee. Yeah, it's not that far. It's also the same location where Steven Spielberg had filmed The Color Purple. Which is really wild. Well, let's stop there for a minute. We'll go to another clip from Evil Dead 2. And when we get back, we'll talk about uh, the production, the release, and that uh, recent sequel that came out. And Sarah Berry's scream. <laughs> What's wrong? I don't like someone just walked over my grave. It's that picture. What is that? 1300 A.D., they called this man the uh, hero from the sky. He was prophesied to have destroyed the evil. Didn't do a very good job. Can you find it? Here it is. Two passages. Recitation of this first passage will make this dark spirit manifest itself in the flesh. Why the hell would we want to do that? Recitation of the second passage creates a kind of rift in time and space. And the physical manifestation of this dark spirit can be forced back into the rift. At least that's the best translation that I can... Huh? That's right. I'm running this show now. We're gonna go out there in them woods and look for Baba Joe. Once we find her, we're getting the hell out of here. No, you idiot! It'll kill us all. She's dead by now. Don't you understand? With these pages, at least we have a chance. Bunch of mumbo jumbo bullshit. Pages don't mean squat. Besides, now 
you ain't got no choice. Now move! Well, normally we talk about the production a lot in Discussion 1, but because there's so much effects work in Evil Dead 2, uh, it just seem, makes more sense to, like, we'll kind of talk about this simultaneously, the production and what they were doing with the effects. And we try not to go too long on special effects, even though a lot of the movies that we cover, especially these genre movies, we've talked extensively in many episodes about practical effects and our love for them. So we won't try to get too crazy with that here. But starting off... The cabin itself is a character in both of these movies. And in Evil Dead 2, because it had a bigger budget and they wanted to get bigger and cooler shots, they had miniatures made. I am like so fascinated (laughs) with miniature effects because you can do so much with them in the way you light them and then the way to get cool exterior shots that you normally wouldn't be able to get if you're on location, especially if you didn't have a crane. I mean, now they have like the drones and stuff. Every, like every indie film has like a drone shot that flies over. And in this movie, they had a miniature made of the cabin that was like handcrafted and then on a platform that had fake trees around it. So a lot of the awesome exterior shots you see are just a miniature model set Uh, As well as the bridge, you know, when Ash can't get across the bridge and you cut to a wide shot and you can kind of tell that it's kind of cartoonish looking. Just looks a little off. But then you see Ash in the shot and you're like, oh, that's a figurine. But they do the shots quick enough to where it doesn't let the effect linger too long to where you see the seams of it too much. Isn't it Ash, the miniature of the bridge, and then behind that is a matte painting? Yes. It's so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's a wonderful thing about Sam Raimi and his crazy brain is integrating so many different effects in one shot together. And matte paintings were used in the original and so many other movies that we've talked about where they're doing a miniature and then a matte painting of a sunset or something that looks three-dimensional. And they do the the basic um, camera effect of doing forced perspective in this numerous times. But I think there are times when... It looks obvious. Evil Dead 2 never makes me feel like I'm I'm not actually, you know, seeing where the original Necronomicon came from. Yeah. And it's also an update on the props, too. Like we have the Kandarian Dagger and the Necronomicon, a new version that Mm -hmm. really uh, we have this whole intro where it's inked in blood and it opens up and there's this great special effect, you know, where they do they have the. All this hand-drawn animation. Yeah, hand-drawn stop animation with superimposed over like a filter of red over like a blood sea. All of that, I think, makes the movie a lot more creative and it opens up the story a little bit more on where these things came from. They bring that out a little bit more. We actually have a couple of scenes when the professor's on the tape and he's telling the story of like them finding the book and finding the dagger. Uh, We actually see where they went to find it. It's a very quick shot, but enough to where it makes this film and universe seem much, much bigger than they did in the original Evil Dead. And can we talk real quick about the stop motion recreation of Linda's dance as as a headless corpse, how she's dancing with her head? That was originally choreographed by... uh, Sam Raimi's, I think it was his high school drama teacher. She performed it, filmed, and then they did animation over that. And, you know, it's the same thing like the, like Jason and the Argonauts or um, uh, Clash of the Titans, like that type of animation that's done. It looks like off, but it's also because it's real and happening like in kind of in front of you. and And it feels very present where CGI feels like there's a, a filter between you. Yeah, and especially with the uh, getting the gray stripe in Bruce that, Campbell's that hair. That is cool. Like stop motion where they have a fan blowing on him and he's trying to be still and then they're just like slowly painting that line one frame at a time, shooting it, and then when it all goes together, it looks really realistic and it feels very natural versus like a, a digital effect, which not, to, you know, there are some like, sort of digitally looking effects in Evil Dead 2, like I think where they used a projection where the there's like the hologram looking image. And those are... They you probably know, used a projector I for I think them. they did project them, <laughs> yeah. And it's not as... You know, doesn't look as great. But, you know, you look at a movie like this, and again, you know, I, we won't get into a big discussion of it, but like most of this stuff would just be digitally made. 
in this movie now and wouldn't look as good, you know, certainly wouldn't look better. But then also using really simple techniques like uh, that would be maybe done digitally now where Ash is talking to himself in the mirror and evil Ash is talking back at him. But, you know, you're so into what's happening and you're looking at evil Ash and it's just his stunt double that has his has his back towards the camera and evil Ash reaches through. All of that is so incredibly simple. Do you think that that effect would be done the same way nowadays? No way. Yeah. Yeah. And it still looks pretty impressive. And yeah. again, like you have to remember, this is, even though they had more money, this was still like roughly around a $3 million budget. But they did have money to hire an actual effects crew that signed on for a 12-week commitment, working pretty much seven days a week. And all of these guys were learning, growing. They were young and hungry and, and pretty wild, you know, too. It seems like effects guys have a all have kind of a, a wild streak or they're very kind of low-key and you'd never assume they have one of the most creative minds out there but this team was headed by mark showstrom and included greg nicotero robert kurtzman howard berger tom sullivan who did the effects for evil dead one aaron sims shannon shea and mike tersick all of these guys on this crew put into molds casting hands faces entire bodies i mean how much foam latex did they go through with this film all of the molds were made in march or april in LA and then they were completed shipped all the way across the country to North Carolina about mid-May and I don't know if it's common for effects guys to be on set I don't think it really is unless there's touch-ups but most if not all of them did fly across the country um, to be on set and of course all of these molds and everything nothing was painted so there was a lot more work to be done it wasn't just completed there in um, a couple weeks the special effects crew that really this was like their first big movie they went on to work on army of darkness with sam raimi uh, did movies like misery uh, people under the stairs they did some freddy movies they did the special effects for Casino, like the eye popping out of the head when he's stuck in the vice grip scene. Yeah. And some of these guys cut out about two weeks before production was over to go work on Creepshow 2. So this is uh, them getting their start. But again, when you watch the effects in this, you realize like this wasn't just a couple people that were interested in effects. And they're just like, hey, let's see what we can make do like they were actually making molds and like were able to do tests and like make sure that the effects were like worthy and in what Sam Raimi wanted you know he was able to work with them along the way and get the effects up to par so that way when they went into production they didn't have all of this time where they're just like hoping stuff works and then it fails. Justin who's your favorite possessed or evil character in Evil Dead 2? I think my favorite is going to have to be Evil Ash when he goes to not it is when he goes demonic I really love the makeup and they bring they come back to it again later in the movie and he looks even more sinister also too because he's the quote unquote hero of the movie to see him go evil is always say uh makes it more scary for me Evil Ash really throws off the audience and I think makes you feel like anything could happen in this movie my favorite thing about Evil Ash is the really simple effect that I wouldn't have ever thought of, which would totally be done digitally, is when Ash first gets possessed and his eyes, because everyone who's a demon, you know, has white eyes, everyone's wearing the white contacts that makes any actor who's wearing them completely blind. But there's a shot in which the white disappears, like a, a fluidy cloudness disappears from the eye, and that was milk being injected into the facial cast. I mean, it's so cool. Like, what a cool idea. And who would have, I would have never thought of that. Yeah, such a great effect. And then to reverse it so it goes back to his regular eyeball. Yeah. So I have a pretty good idea, Lindsay, but what is your favorite demonic possession in Evil Dead 2? Because I told you what I put for $80 in my Amazon cart, but I haven't I got a, purchased yet. I think I got a pretty good idea. Are you <laughs> going to pull the trigger on that? I don't know. I don't know. But I love the Evil Ed makeup. I mean, it is some of the scariest stuff I've ever seen. An oversized mouth of teeth is one of the most terrifying things I can think of. And, of course, modeled after what most of my nightmares since childhood have been modeled after, which was Amanda Bierce in Fright Night when she turns into a vampire. Her her mouth was the inspiration behind Evil Ed's mouth. Evil Ed has three sets of teeth. It looks never-ending. just ending. keep going. Yeah, just like set upon set upon set of teeth. 
And that was a smart thing to do because the actor couldn't shut his mouth. And I think if you're just doing rows and rows and rows of teeth, and if he can't shut his mouth, then you're never going to know where his teeth are. These are latex masks. And so they cut to the actor's reactions a lot to, and then cut back to the action of like one of the demons like reaching the arms out or something. So you don't hold too long to see that it's an actual mask, which makes it creepy and it keeps the effects looking, you know, keeps the magic going, keeps them looking you know, fairly realistic. And poor Richard Dormier, who played Ed, because he couldn't shut his mouth with that mask on that cast, uh, he was just constantly drooling. But I think I would take constant drool and jaw pain over what Ted Raimi had to go through playing the possessed Henrietta from the basement. Which we both agree is the creepiest creation. Uh, Really crazy that he's wearing like a full bodysuit for this character Awful. and sam's original vision for that henrietta was supposed to be like really small and almost skeletal but because of all of the abuse that that character goes through in the movie the effects team was like we have to make her larger in order to have like wasting away and being able to pull away and so that's why she is like kind of this just gross like oversized baby that like kind of like a that terrible makeup in uh nothing but trouble that's what it always reminds me of (laughs) but um much grosser and also let's keep in mind too that this production was so immensely hot everybody comments on how hot it was in north carolina at this time and if you watch in the movie you know you could think oh man everybody's getting sprayed down with something no everyone is just sweating profusely it's a very sweaty look for the movie some of the behind the scenes stuff that they had uh one of them like almost made me gag it's like them uh, every day that they when they would take the these boots off of uh, theodore ramey's feet like they would just wring out like tons of sweat from his body uh and that's just super disgusting but yeah his like body just was not able to breathe in the suit and he said that he was 20 when he got asked to do this and his brother had already made evil dead and he like had a budget and he was like yeah i'll i'll, I'll like be in this suit for like six weeks and do whatever you say and all my pores are covered and I'm just like drowning in my own sweat. It's no exaggeration just wringing out his socks and Bruce Campbell said that the crew had little Dixie cups that they would keep his sweat that they would wring out in the Dixie cups every day. I don't know if that's an exaggeration but that's disgusting and also hilarious. You can see how sweaty he is in the awesome scene where Ted Raimi in the Henrietta costume is spinning and levitating and attacking Annie and Ash confronts her. The jarring, like kind of like side head move that Henrietta makes, Ted Raimi's head tilts down to the side and you can see coming out of the ear is just this con- like stream of liquid. That wasn't an effect. That was the sweat that was accumulating inside the costume of Henrietta. Like, you can see it. I I, I thought that it was an exaggeration because I've never noticed it before. But then going back and and watching it was like, oh, no, there's a solid stream coming out of that. As well as all the special effects getting upgraded for Evil Dead 2, Sam Raimi also brought along his bag of tricks and all his special shots that he used in Evil Dead. He did bigger and better ones for Evil Dead 2, the shaky cam, the Ramacam, where it's like the evil entities like coming toward a character. The audience is seeing the point of view of the evil entity kind of flying through the cabin and a really great shot of it kind of chasing Ash through the cabin. Same thing that we had with the first one, only this one much, much bigger and faster and more like knocking over more stuff. His willingness to put the camera through total abuse along with who's ever in front of the camera just astounds me. Like the Ramacam, mounting that on a pole and just like literally ramming it through a car. That I mean, there was a little bit of, uh, I think there was something to pre-break in front of the camera, but still, even putting Bruce Campbell, um, like strapping him to a mechanism that twirled him clockwise, counterclockwise, while he's being beaten with bushes to simulate the evil force ramming into him. I mean, it's just, it's bonkers. And his also use of uh, slowing and speeding up the camera, shooting those effects in real time, and shooting things forward and then reversing them to give different special effects. Uh, these are old techniques that have been around forever, but Sam Raimi, even though he had more money to 
do special effects, he was still saying, you know, why not we do it in camera? It's still going to look good. We can do these sort of very simple effects uh, just by reversing or slowing down the film. This seems like an old timey effect to the the mesmerizer effect where images are kind of distorted to seem flatter and then, you know, combining that with a Dutch angle or something to make the audience feel completely like, I don't know what reality is anymore. And there's only, there's one section where it happens very intensely with the the mesmerizer distorting images, but it's really effective and it's happening during a moment when the sound is kind of taken down a lot where we know that the evil entity is somewhere in the room and the visuals are what uh, is creating the uh, tension. And as well as all the techniques that Sam Raimi brought into Evil Dead 2, he also brought in a little more extensive script with more dialogue and more parts for actors to play. And a lot of the movies that we talk about on this podcast have bigger casts of big well-known names. We've already talked about Bruce Campbell a lot in our first episode, but the smaller roles in here are important. You know, they weren't played by big names or people that went on to be household names, but continued to work in the industry and did many parts, starting with Danny Hicks, who plays the redneck and does a really unique job. When I was younger, I was just like, what'd they find this guy at like a roadhouse somewhere? Does a really good job of not overdoing it too much. You know, it's like just enough of like the accent and just enough of like that sort of goofy, like hundred buck, you know, yeah. like very, and you know, and all his like crying, but Bobby Joe, like Bobby I, lo- Joe. I love all of that, like screaming and uh, getting, you know, upset. But in, I think he, he's the one that brings sort of the I don't know if it was intended, but bring some of the humor to the movie just because he's such an outrageous character. He also brought some humor to his audition, too. Bruce Campbell said that his audition was okay, but Dan Hicks maybe felt like he needed to amp it up or something or needed to make an impression. So he said, do you guys want me to take my teeth out? And so he proceeded to take the bridge of his teeth out. And uh, that's what landed him the role. For for a hick, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Having a few missing teeth is very noticeable on screen. And I think Ted Raimi accidentally broke his nose uh, grabbing him in one scene. There was a lot of abuse on this set. And Ted Raimi did, you know, you don't see his face in the movie because he's in the Henrietta costume, but he did go on to work with his brother on just about every movie and got bigger and better roles where he has speaking roles and in front of the camera he's got a substantial role in the Spider-Man movies as one of the reporters. Hopefully he doesn't need an oxygen tank kept on set like he did in Evil Dead 2. Yeah. The poor guy. Now, this was not only the film debut for Dan Hicks, but it was also for Cassie Wesley, who plays Baba Joe, the girlfriend of Jake, the the Hick, who's, I mean, I feel like she's a little too attractive, honestly, to to be with. I know that that's probably... Send me an email. Not Send me a, a lot complaint. of choices out there in the in the backwoods. <laughs> I guess that's true. Cassie Wesley does a great job um, in this role with what she's given. But fun fact is that Raimi originally wanted his old roommate, Holly Hunter, to play this. But it was Rob Tappert that was like, nah, we need somebody sexier. Come on. Way to go, Rob Tappert. Yeah. Could have had Holly Hunter in Evil Dead 2. <laughs> that would have been awesome. But Cassie Wesley went on to have like a 25 year long career on one life to live and days of our lives and guiding light. Like she's had a great career and someone else who went on to have a pretty substantial uh, role in their life would be Richard Dormier who played Ed evil Ed. Um, He went on to be like the biggest host on QVC. So bizarre. I know. Can you imagine like he's hosting selling stuff on QVC and they're like, you seen my movie evil dead 2 where i turn into a demon <laughs> he said people come up to him and ask him like or like sheepish to like ask him to sign something and he's like really are you serious well it's like i think too it's but when, you know we'll get into the legacy of this movie but yeah it's like all these actors who you know this was just a one summer of their life when they were younger yeah. and then 30 years later people are you know wanting to get their autograph because they were a part of something that has just had such a lasting effect i'll tell you who has left a lasting effect on me for Evil Dead 2 is Sarah Barry and that scream, which is what landed her the role was her very intense, shrill scream. The character of Annie Noby, who's the daughter of this researcher, she's a really smart character. She's a professional. It's almost like her scream 
that she's not actually scared. Like she's screaming as a reaction to something, but she doesn't really ever seem scared. She just seems like she's in peril, but her scream is... Do you know what I'm saying? I, I know making... I know what you're saying. Yeah, it's like she's not scared. She's just screaming the scream yeah, because it... the, the movie warrants it, which makes sense. You know, it's a horror movie in the 80s. The woman is usually screaming, you know. Uh, it's like a reaction scream. Yeah, it's like a reaction scream. But also, too, she's the only one to me in this movie that's like acting like she's in a different movie. Her character uh-huh. is like comes off real sinister in the beginning, like whenever they meet up with Bobby Joe and Jake and the bridge is out, they're like negotiating this, like showing them how to get to the cabin. She like comes off more sinister. She's like licking her lips. And I know she's going to trick them with uh, saying, you'll carry my luggage. They don't know that she has this big heavy thing, but it's almost like this very sinister, like evil plotting kind of licking your lips face. It's very strange. It like seems out of place, but serviceable to the movie and the script. In a lot of ways, though, her character kind of saves Ash's ass. I mean, even though she dies, um, she saves him, really. The characters in Evil Dead 2 are a little more interesting. They're a little more dynamic. There's more to them than just your generic five friends that are going up to a cabin to smoke weed and have sex and then get killed. Yeah. She's on a mission to find her father and knows about this stuff. She knows about the Book of the Dead and the dagger. You know, she has knowledge. Mm-hmm. Ash doesn't know what the heck is going on. He's just getting kicked in the face and thrown yeah. in the cellar as soon as they get there. So like every lower budgeted horror movie in the 80s, once post-production started, the director would generally begin their battle with the ratings board on trying to get an R rating and not get an NC-17 rating or an unrated version so that that way it could play in the most amount of theaters and make the most amount of money. Sam Raimi experienced this on the first Evil Dead, but it was even worse on Evil Dead 2. They kept making cuts and sending it to the ratings board, and the ratings board were like, you need to trim this. It's too bloody. It's too violent. They kept getting an X rating or NC-17, whichever was happening right around that time. But if you didn't have an R rating, it was really hard to play in most theater houses. Um, You were much more limited if you had higher than an R rating. So there was one workaround that they figured out, and it's kind of cool of uh, Dino De Laurentiis for letting this happen. The president of the marketing arm of Dino's company said that if Evil Dead was cut down to have an R rating, it would probably have a running time of like 60 minutes. And one, that's going to destroy Sam Raimi's vision for his film, and two, audiences aren't going to see that, and it's 60 minutes. Come on. So what they did was create basically a a phantom company called Rosebud Releasing. It wasn't a real company, but this is how they could kind of skirt around um, not being beholden to having an R rating by the MPAA. This also meant that Dino De Laurentiis' company wouldn't be named on the film. But of course, they're still going to get residuals from this. And Dino had already booked the film for, I think it was like 350 theaters, something like that. So the marketing campaign, advertising, it was all already out there. This was just to skirt around and make sure that the movie could be released in the way it was intended to be seen. And another workaround that Sam Raimi was thinking of during production was this movie is littered with multiple different colors of blood. We've got, there's green, I think there's a blue in there, there's yellow, of course red, black. Um, This was another way that Sam Raimi was trying to skirt around dealing with the MPAA because he knew from his previous experience that excessive bloodletting is uh, something that the MPAA is not a fan of. And having a bigger budget, they were also able to do test screenings to see how the movie was playing tonally because they did change it up a little bit. They did add more humor. Some of the test screenings didn't go great. People didn't know whether they should laugh. They didn't know if it was, is it supposed to be scary? Is it supposed to be funny? Uh, much way the same way uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Around the 80s, directors were starting to play with that idea of like, we can make certain things funny. We don't have to be in your face, scary the entire movie, and we can make things a little more entertaining. That works sometimes. It's it's really failed other times. I think Evil Dead 2 has come a long way. I think that, you know, maybe audiences at first didn't gravitate toward the humor, but now, you know, like you mentioned earlier, it's a party film. Like, it's a really good movie to see in a group because of the humor and because you can, you know, it's so slap 
sticky at times. You know, uh, an audience can really get into it and laugh as well as be terrified at the same time. But the movie ended up being fairly successful. It made about six million dollars at the box office, which doubled its budget. And bigger success, I think, on VHS is where I saw Evil Dead 2. I think I was around 10 years old whenever Evil Dead 2 hit video cassette when you would be in the mom and pop stores. And I would always gravitate toward the horror section because they had the most interesting looking covers. And that skull on the Evil Dead 2 box always kept me from renting it because I thought it was going to be too terrifying to watch. And it wasn't until like maybe... I would say like two years later that I saw it on cable and then also on VHS where I was like, oh man, I really love this movie. It's actually kind of fun and it's not as terrifying as that. That was a really good, as far as like making something seem scary, that skull on the box and just Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn is also a fairly creepy tagline. It's a skull with these very human eyes that just seem to be looking at you no matter where you move. I don't mind that the cover really doesn't feel like it has much to do with the movie no not at all no (laughs) but through the success of evil dead 2 sam raimi was actually able to get a deal to produce an original film for universal studios which would be a dream come true you know he wanted to eventually do bigger and better films and so he made dark man for universal because that was a surprise hit a lot to do with the marketing of that movie of who is dark man and this you know predates like there being a million superhero type movies. So Sam Raimi was a big superhero fan. And so he sort of made this early prototype for Spider-Man. And then Universal was like, hey, this is a hit. You know, what do you want to do? And he wanted to make a sequel to Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness, which is such a different movie. Uh, I watched it last night for this episode and... I've always loved that movie, but it's on such a bigger scale, and Ash is now a fully formed character, and I think the character that's fully formed in Army of Darkness is the Ash that we see throughout the rest of the Evil Dead franchise of, like, Ash versus Evil Dead, and I think, like, what Bruce Campbell, even his persona is known for of this, like, wisecracking, you know, I'm gonna say something a little bit dirty mixed with, like, a little bit offensive, but, like, (laughs) in a very, like, hammy sort of way. Army of Darkness is quite an interesting movie to watch, but if you watch it bit right on the heels of Evil Dead 2 like I did, it, it is a nice continuation because we do get the ending of Evil Dead 2 where he's trapped, but then we actually go for deeper into that world of like this movie takes place way in the past and it's just kind of crazy. But after Army of Darkness came out and that was released in 1992, there was just constant Evil Dead talk from fans. And I think 10 years after Army of Darkness came out, there was like another generation that like, you know, their older brother, sister, like passed on the VHS tape and the fandom for Evil Dead, just whole trilogy became really big. And then once the internet hit and social media hit, more and more people wanted Evil Dead. So they finally did make a remake of Evil Dead, which we both watched together one night outside. And it is a, I would say, a really strong remake. It's very brutal, much more brutal than any of the Evil Dead movies. Yeah. Uh, it's a very menacing, very mean-spirited movie. I've got mixed feelings about it. I do know that it's very, very well-respected, and it made more money theatrically than like all of the Evil Dead movies <laughs> did combined. <laughs> but then they also went on to make the television series Ash vs. Evil Dead, which is kind of going, taking it back more to like an Evil Dead 2, Army of Darkness vibe where Ash, you know, Ash didn't appear in the Evil Dead remake. In the new, new one that came out, Evil Dead Rise, it's like really new. Um, We both just watched that streaming recently. And I got to say, I enjoyed it. It's a, you know, it has a great opening. They tone it down a little bit. It feels like less in your face they're not going to make it grisly as the 2013 uh, remake this one felt like there was a little bit extra humor added there was a little more like more characters that are not just waiting to get killed it was like there was like they kind of built a story of like a family aspect going on and it also isn't now we're in a different location it's not just them in a cabin somewhere they're like in an apartment complex in the city and so you get a whole new atmosphere going on that you haven't seen before in the new new one the 2023 one there were some moments of 
genuine like react like physical reaction for me but that's not a bad thing um i really enjoyed it the 2013 one it is super dark both visually and and overall and its vibe i don't know i might like evil dead rise more than i like the 2013 one but i definitely don't think that they do anything to bastardize what came before them or anything like that yeah i agree i like the new one better than the 2013 but i have to say i was thinking about this last night and like just as a as a franchise you know for including everything from the first evil dead to the ash versus evil dead television show to these last two evil dead continuations that don't have the ash character this is a great franchise man i can't really say that there's like a bad movie in there you can't say that about yeah. Freddy or Friday the 13th or, geez, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is a pretty solid franchise. But I think the reason for that is is because Sam Raimi and Rob Tabbert and Bruce Campbell have stayed either producing, they've had some hand in every single one of these continuations of this franchise and i think that's why they're all solid you know they didn't want anything to go out that had the evil dead stamp on it that wasn't worthy and you know with these other franchises you know they're changing hands so much between produce you know they may all get put out by the same studio but you know directors are changing hands producers are changing hands different writers what have you and to have three of the key people that were there from the very start for 40 years to continue yeah. on producing or being a part of the series. I think that really shows. And I think that's why this franchise stands out more than other horror franchises that have come out in the last 40 or 50 years. Yeah. It still seems like there's a pure heart behind the horror. And I really enjoyed Ash versus evil dead. I know that it was pretty grueling on Bruce Campbell and I don't know if he would really ever want to do that or anything like that again, but I, I enjoyed that. I wish that there would have been the foresight to do an Ash vs. Evil Dead uh, television series like right off of the heels of Army of Darkness. Oh, yeah. Like when Bruce Campbell was in his most kind of like fit, square jaw, like Hollywood looking, yeah. handsome lead actor which it is you know when i'm watching evil dead 2 and especially army of darkness it's just like man how did no one see this guy and be like this guy is like a hand has got a handsome mug he's fit you know he can do like comedy and physical action like how did he not get in yeah. uh at least a secondary character in like big action comedy type stuff in the 90s because there was a lot of that it seemed like you could have plugged him in so many different areas but maybe it was because he was acting in horror movies there was like this stigma of you know oh he's not a good actor because he's in horror movies but he carved out a really awesome cult movie career he's written like some great books if you haven't read them they're you know a lot of insider and a lot of insight on being in the industry and being known as like the sort of like cult b-movie actor and how that that shaped his life and his career. I kind of grew up watching Briscoe County Jr. I loved that show and I loved him yeah. in it. Even though that they couldn't do him younger when they did Ash vs. Evil Dead, I do like this idea that this character is like older and grizzled and been out of the game. And it's not just a bunch of old fart jokes. It's no, yeah. they actually like, you know, make his character give it even more depth in the TV series. And he's he's still an attractive man. Yeah. Still does some of the best, most entertaining q and I've seen him do a and a like four or five times. And during the pandemic, I was able to go see Evil Dead 2 and Army of Darkness at the drive-in, at the Midway Drive-In in Dixon, Illinois. And he came all the way out there to do a Q&A after the movie and just hammed it up and was awesome with the audience. And he's done this. He's said these stories a million times. You know, I'm sure he knows them. But he still brings that same enthusiasm. I mean, he's been talking about Evil Dead for like 40 <laughs> years, and he still is able to muster the enthusiasm to answer someone asking a question that he's heard 100,000 times. Yeah. Well, let's stop here. We'll come back to Evil Dead 2 for some final thoughts. But let's get into our picks of the week. I know I went the Campbell route, and you didn't, and that's okay. We've talked a lot about Bruce Campbell, but what was your pick of the week again? It was brain damage, but I mean, the main character looks like the younger brother of Bruce Campbell. I'm really curious to hear about it. 
What brought me to this inspired pick of the week were quite a few things. The writer-director aspect, same as Evil Dead 2, the low-budget, can-do attitude of the production, and the stop-motion animation and special effects. Hailing from 1988, Brain Damage treads the fine line of horror and comedy in the same manner as Evil Dead 2, but has much darker undertones. The second film from Frank Henenlotter gets going pretty quickly in, with barely any introduction to the main character, Brian, played by future daytime soap star Rick Hurst. Brian's awakened by his girlfriend to go out that night, suddenly feels sick, and quickly cancels plans with her. Brian's left home alone, disoriented, and literally falling on the ground, crawling to the bathroom. Something is painfully wrong with our beautiful jawline for days protagonist. And only a quick 13 minutes in, we discover that Brian has a new friend. About a foot-long, very phallic-looking, blue-in-color creature we come to know as Elmer. Not Elmer, Elmer. Elmer's a rather slimy, gross-looking little guy who speaks with a very distinguished, educated voice and who's chosen Brian to be his new host, I mean, friend. For centuries, the Elmer has been a coveted creature who brings psychedelic euphoria, transformative hallucinations, and happiness to whomever his human counterpart might be. And he does this via a little needle-like protrusion that extends from inside his mouth. Then, via access to the base of his human friend's skull, Elmer injects a little blue juice directly onto the brain, causing immediate euphoria and an altered reality of neon lights, colors, and convenient mind erasing. Once Brian gets a taste of Elmer's blue juice, it's an instant addiction. But what does Elmer need in return? Oh, you know, just to feast on the occasional human brain. The little scamp just lives off the nutrients, and human brains are what gives him the most strength. This story is very much about addiction, and writer-director Henan Lauder admits to having written this movie because of his previous cocaine addiction. But I wouldn't say that the concept of addiction is the movie's point for existing. It's not an anti- or pro-drug film. It's very much an ooey-gooey creature feature. Elmer does talk to Brian like a drug pusher, giving thinly-veiled suggestions like, I'll show you the light if you take me for a walk. I'll do all your thinking for you, Brian. I wish I could do Elmer's voice justice because it's very much like a radio host. Like, come on, Brian, let's go out tonight. You don't want to let me down now, do you? So it adds to the comic value of this little penis-like creature. To me, brain damage speaks more about the idea of escapism and how there's no real cure for addiction. It's just a constant battle of will. And that said, there is a certain sadness to the film, even though it's littered with trying to laugh through the significant gross-out moments with really tactile-looking practical special effects. This film leaves a very lasting impression, but I wouldn't say it would make you afraid of the dark. The oddly shaped penis creature of Almer is dark blue, has tiny doll-like eyes, and a half-exposed blue-colored brain and a mouth that would put Fright Night's vamped-out Amanda Bierce to shame. While brain damage fits into the punk rock horror genre, I wouldn't call it a total splatterfest. It has a fair amount of blood, but when it's excessive, it's meant to be comical. When Brian tries to quit Almer and goes through having withdrawal symptoms, it's one of the more nauseating scenes of blood, which feels like Hen and Lauder might have been wanting audiences to laugh from being so uncomfortable. There's no excessive gore to speak of, but there is one scene involving Almer hiding in Brian's pants while Brian's high on blue juice and an innocent punk rocker girl is about to perform a sex act, that scene is effective in making your mind think worse visuals than what could ever be communicated on screen. Speaking of sex acts, there's definitely a sexual undertone to brain damage. It's very heightened, feels seedy, and happens every time Brian's pleading for Almer's hallucinatory blue juice, which is immediately followed by Brian's unbridled reaction of intense pleasure. I'm surprised Hen and Lauder didn't go a little further with this, but I wonder if that had something to do with late 80s censors, but I'm not sure. The music of Brain Damage also cements it in amongst some classic horror tones of the decade, haunting synths with deep moods and a certain breathiness that adds to the tingling exhilaration that lies beneath the surface, reminding us the whole time that the excitement is brief and might end in a metaphorical K-hole. The music also seamlessly blends in with Hen and Lauder's lighting and coloration, too. Shadows are used to obscure and highlighting rich or blown-out shades of blue, accentuating Almer's blue juice that is ruling Brian's life. It's playful but unsettling. All of it together only expounds upon Brian's many dreamlike states, or more later in the film, a terrible life-ending drug trip, and Hen and Lauder makes a moment like that into a rapturous moment of release. Rick Hurst is really going all out as Brian. His struggle never feels forced, and for a guy who's toggling between addiction and ultimate bliss, Hurst really sells it. 
especially when many of your scenes involve talking to a phallic-like demented puppet with the voice of a radio personality. This isn't Henenlotter's first dive into the concept of a human being codependent on a freak of nature like Elmer. His first film in 1982, Basket Case, dealt with a similar notion, except it was a murderous, formerly conjoined twin whose adult human half hauled him around in a wicker basket. While that film has become a total cult favorite, I think Brain Damage is moving that way too, especially since it's Blu-ray released through Arrow Video. But I'm always surprised to read how many people love Basket Case but can't stand Brain Damage. Both are tonally dark films, but Brain Damage's moments of levity make it much more of a rewatchable film for me. Before I close out, if you do choose to embark on this brain-damaged trip, please watch out for my favorite scene involving Elmer hiding in the mouth of Brian as he boards a train with his trying-to-understand-his-struggle girlfriend. It blends in comedy to this impending horrific moment that you're already predicting, but Henenlotter visually executes it in a stealthily quiet and perverse way. I can't say enough how much I enjoy this visceral, psychedelic shock to the system that oozes some of the most enjoyable body horror visuals of the decade. Yeah, it's been a while since I've sat down and watched a good body horror movie, so I've got this on my uh, calendar to watch uh, during October. I can't believe I haven't seen this movie. I know I've heard of it, and I know you've talked about it a ton of times, but I still haven't uh, actually sat down and watched it. That Blu-ray has been in my Amazon cart for a while. I just haven't pulled the trigger yet, but I can't wait to own that. And Justin, I think it's your turn. Tell me about your uh, Evil Dead 2 pick of the week. Well, I also chose sort of a strange uh, pick of the week very odd movie All right. and uh as odd as the description of this movie is it's kind of an even odder movie um when you watch it i chose bubba hotep which is a 2002 movie by don coscarelli who i think i did one of his uh movies survival quest early early on in one of our episodes and he did all the Phantasm movies. This is my favorite movie of his. It's a very, very strange film. It stars one of my favorite uh, B-movie actors, Bruce Campbell, who is playing Elvis or a version of Elvis in this movie. It also stars Ossie Davis, who, um, if you remember, played a really great role in Do the Right Thing. Here he plays John F. Kennedy, which I know is odd because John F. Kennedy is white and Ossie Davis is black, but he said the government dyed his skin. Both of these two are residing in a retirement home in East Texas, and a mummy has somehow found its way into a retirement home, and it's sucking the souls out of the retirement uh, community and killing them off. And that just that setup alone uh, got me in the seat. Um, whenever this movie was released, Don Coscarelli did a U.S. tour with the movie and did a Q&A, and I went to that when I was living in Austin. And I loved it so much for the midnight screening. I went like came back the next night and saw the second screening of it. And this movie's a lot of fun, but if the setup of this movie doesn't get you there, it's actually a really well-made movie on the act of aging. It gets a little dark, mind you, and kind of reminiscent of more modern movies like uh, Ty West's X, talking about the aging process but making that part of the horror of the movie. And there's some pretty disgusting stuff in this that uh, Bruce Campbell's Elvis is talking about what's going on with his penis. He's having some issues, uh, old person issues, and... Some of it is pretty gross. I mean, the movie itself isn't really a gross-out movie. I wouldn't call it like a like a gorehound type movie. So I always kind of measure it by uh, Mary, my wife, um, really isn't into like gross movies. And uh, she was able to make it through Bubba Hotep and really enjoyed it. It does, like I said, it gets into some of the the aging process and you know feeling like useless and you you know used up and no one cares about you and being stuck in this retirement home. But once the mission of them eradicating this mummy kicks off where JFK and Elvis join forces and are determined to eliminate the mummy, uh, the movie really kicks up and the action kicks up a little bit. The movie itself has a pretty low budget and at times uh, the limited budget, you you can see it on the screen. But overall, uh, the atmosphere of the movie is pretty creepy. The music's pretty creepy. Um, it's based off of a really good novella by Joe R. Lansdale, who has made several horror novellas, and the adaption is really great. They were going to make a sequel to this where it was going to be Dracula fighting Elvis, but as far as I could find in research, it seemed like Bruce Campbell and Don Coscarelli didn't see eye to eye on certain things, so that movie never happened, which 
man, I really wish it did because this is one of my favorite Bruce Campbell roles outside of his uh, role of Ash in the Evil Dead series. And he does it really, really well. I mean, he's playing it pretty straight, you know, and they they kind of explain why these guys think they are these famous people. Um, But for the most part, it's that's the surface level of it. The the big meat of the movie is them tracking down this mummy and saving the retirement community. And it has a lot of uh, humor in it. There are these two uh, orderlies who are, you know, who work at the morgue and they're picking up the bodies and there's some comedy between them. And, you know, it sets the tone for the movie right away is like this is horror comedy. It's got some atmosphere. It's a perfect movie, in my opinion, to watch anytime. But like especially during the month of October, if you're looking to pick some movies to watch for uh, the holiday, I can't recommend it enough. And thank you, Stan, for drinking water while I was trying to finish up my pick of the week. Um, so that weird noise you heard in the background was just Stanley drinking some water. And he stopped right when you were he done. He did, yeah, speaking. he knew. He was like, oh, you're done talking. I'll stop drinking water loudly. Thanks, Stan. Way to go, Stan. You know, you recounting the description of Bubba Hotep, I had forgotten, like, I think a lot of this movie. It's been a while since I've seen it. And I don't know if maybe it was in high school or something at somebody's house, but... Um, there's a few scenes that I really remember like loving and I can't wait to revisit this movie. I, I guess I should put out, I, I never, I don't want to get negative, but it is a slower film. You know, it, it takes its time to develop what's going on mm-hmm. and develop the characters, yeah. um, but it's well worth it. But it is a movie that um, the pacing is a little bit on the slow side, but then it kind of ramps up. But I think it would be weird if the pacing was really quick because they are two old characters in a retirement yeah, home. Exactly. Everybody in here is like, over 65 75 and so no nobody's really moving quickly you know through the scenes that's also part of the humor yes of it too. yeah they yeah, they do the uh there's a you know you've seen it in so many movies especially um now like i think every comedy does it where they have all the characters in the movie kind of coming around a corner in slow motion mm-hmm. you know and two of the effect of humor and you know this movie's over 20 years old and it did it and it's elvis and uh JFK coming around the corner and Elvis is in a walker yeah. and JFK is in a wheelchair, you know, mo- mo- motorized wheelchair and it slows, shows them in slow motion kind of like getting ready for battle. I do and remember that scene. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. All right. Thank you for that, Justin. Well, those are our picks of the week for Evil Dead 2, Bubba Hotep and Brain Damage. Quite a triple feature if you wanted to program something. Here's your Murray moment. <laughs> Chicks dig me because I rarely wear underwear, and when I do, it's usually something unusual. I think I need a root canal. I'm sure I need a long, slow root canal. You're gonna come and shake my monkey tree again? Oh, what does that old queen know? She didn't even chill. Okay, this is so scrumptious. Is this hand shot? The flowing robes embrace all striking. That was fun. The year Evil Dead was released, Bill was still in his minor hiatus from Hollywood phase, post-Ghostbusters. Really only a few small appearances in two films and a pre-Scrooged Buster Poindexter music video. But he did host one SNL episode actually the same week that Evil Dead was released. And while we might revisit that episode at some point in the future, let's venture to almost exactly a month after Evil Dead 2 was released. What was Billy doing? Well, April 17th, 1987... He was standing in for Chicago Cubs announcer Harry Carey in the announcer's booth before, during, and after the game against the Montreal Expos. Carey had recently suffered a stroke, and having been more well-known than a Chicago hot dog laced with relish and all the trimmings, the baseball club sought out another popular local to help out Steve Stone in the announcer's booth, longtime Cubs fan Billy Murray. I was baptized a Cubs fan, Bill said on the air. It was a beautiful day at Wrigley, and if you've ever been to a Cubs game, you might be familiar with the feeling that that ballpark has on a sunny day. During some pregame action, Bill was able to take a couple swings at the bat and hitting uh, pitches off retired pitcher Glenn Brummer, but soon found himself seated up in the announcer's booth eating a hot dog on the air. His sense of sly, casual humor was firing full force from moment one, peppering in observations about the crowd, wondering if his family was out there, and the Cubs' nemesis that day, the Expos, as well as their Canadian national anthem. Frankly, I love O Canada, he said. 
because there's only like 10 words to it. I wish they'd let me sing it. It's one of the goofiest national anthems I've ever heard. It makes the national anthem for the U.S. sound like Beethoven's Ninth. In case it needs to be explained, Bill has a lot of Canadian friends and personal connections to Canada, plus having spent a lot of time with Second City Toronto. All of that's pretty well known. Everything that came out of the man's mouth this day was just making fun of something. They're no good, Bill says of the Expos. They shouldn't even be here. He's razzing each and every player as their names announced on the roster that day. But when each Cubs player's name is announced, his lopsided bias becomes unbridled, running off the cuff every second, and pretty sure he's inflating some egos and exaggerating some Cubs stats. At one point, though, Bill drops a childhood story about being kicked out of the Wilmette Little League. He was a catcher, number 15, and wouldn't you know it, that little Murray boy's mom pulled some strings to get him back reinstated in the league and he hit a home run at his first at bat. There was another Mama Lucille moment when Steve Stone, Bill's wrangler and announcing co-host, commented that Bill was wearing black and yellow instead of the Cubs colors. The Pirates were here yesterday, Stone joked. Well, my mother dressed me, and she selected these colors. Bill then pivots, takes aim at his mom, and says, I could have predicted my mom wouldn't be here on time. She's not even here. I know it. If I know her, she's probably gotten into some pushing incident on the L and won't even make it. Returning to the play-by-play of our 1987 game at hand, Bill's now holding out a giant fishing net from the announcer's booth as if he's catching fly balls. The man's observations about shirtless guys in the crowd, the hooligan kids outside the stadium he's accusing of stealing hubcaps, and at length talking about how long it took the umpires to get ready for the game. Of course, all the while still razzing every single expo player who comes up to bat. This guy's got drool or tobacco juice on his face. It's just a sad state of affairs that the Cubs even have to play these guys. I'm here today to turn this around, and with the help of the overrated, and he's yelling now, not such a big deal after all Montreal Expos, the Cubs will triumph today. And the Cubs weren't really all that hot at this point in 87, but they did happen to win this game. Thank God they won. The most horrible sound in my youth was listening to Jack Brickhouse after the game and that sound of people popping empty cups after a Cubs loss, Bill said. It haunted me, and all I hoped was that I wouldn't have to hear that sound today. Instead, we've got a bunch of ugly people screaming and hollering because the Cubs won. In case you're wondering, Lucille Murray, Bill's mother, did actually show up and was spotted in the announcer's booth and was name-checked by Steve Stone, a job well done by Mrs. Murray's little boy, Bill. And Bill did stay on the air throughout the entire game, periodically dipping out. For the most part, he was totally present. And during the post-game with Steve Stone, Bill dives back into his sarcastic realism. Well, I was in the locker room. I had advanced knowledge. I knew they were clean, rested, ready. They had some decent suntans they'd managed to hold on to from Arizona. I felt good about today's game. I'm glad Rick Sutcliffe, the Cubs pitcher, did so well, because frankly, he owes me money. If you stayed through until the postgame, there's a ton of time where fans are walking by off camera where Steve and Bill are on the air enchanting Bill's name or We Want Bill over and over for a really long time. The final stats of this game, 7-0 Cubs, Expos had 4 hits while the Cubbies had 11, and I gotta say, hearing Billy get so hyped up whenever the Cubs score a run really speaks to any fan of baseball. You hear his tone and you know he is in this game genuinely excited, and even yelling at fans to scream louder as he's in the announcer's booth. I hadn't really thought of it until now, but since this is our Halloween episode, Billy is playing the role of a baseball announcer. His colorful commentary is legendary, and and he pulled it off really well. And as a softball player myself, listening to Bill announce during almost this entire game was such a treat to find. Just a few weeks after Evil Dead 2 was released upon this world, so was Bill Murray, the Cubs baseball announcer. I like that uh, if you couldn't find something uh, scary, you you went right to baseball. <laughs> and his his turn is uh, playing the role of a, a baseball guy, baseball announcer. Yeah. His second career, he probably... I think he yeah, could have had a pretty good career as a baseball announcer. Yeah. He probably would have gotten fired pretty quickly or yeah. something. <laughs> I feel like that is something that takes a lot of improvising, which he's, you know, yeah. we both know he's really good at. His commentary might be too colorful for more than one or two games that's true yeah this was definitely not the uh last time uh that he announced in the cubs booth but um was it was awesome to find if you piece together you can find this entire game kind of on youtube in different pieces i love that he still continues to love chicago and i wish we had our version of uh someone who reps st louis all the time i guess we have a few people but yeah john ham yeah it's true. That's true you know 
But, yeah. you know, we don't have Bonnie Hunt and Bill Murray. It's true. I think Eddie Vedder, too. Yeah. You got uh, John Cusack. Yeah. Man, there's a lot of people. Just keep rattling them off. Yep. We love the Cubs. <laughs> well, thanks for that Murray moment. Of course. Before we close things out for our Halloween October special, do we have any final thoughts on Evil Dead or anything else uh, Halloween related? All of the Evil Dead franchise has so many little behind the scenes nuggets. Um, learning that Raimi hosted a talent show for as the rap party for everybody for the cast and crew to like get on stage and like you know sing and play instruments is like it's pretty cute when he did that probably my favorite nugget that i've taken out of this and can't unsee it and i love it that it was kept in there and there was really no way around it was the giant rip in the ass to crotch of ted ramey's um suit for Hen his henrietta suit um if you see it he's he's spinning above annie noby spinning around and around and around and you see a giant yeah i think he's wearing like red boxers or something underneath the suit um so on top of him sweating profusely out of that costume the costume was also starting to break down and has a giant very obvious rip in it and i love that it's kept in there i don't know that many people would notice it unless it's called out i mean i've watched evil dead too yeah. i don't know how many times and that movie just moves so fast and frantically that it's hard to catch little inconsistencies and um and that henrietta suit's disgusting so you're not yeah. like really thinking yeah. about yeah there being a possible if there is a rip in the crotch maybe that's part of the the monster that yeah. is henrietta i wanted to take a second to just talk about Raimi as a horror director he hasn't really gone back to it um in a long time and he rarely directs a movie anymore he mostly does producing and when he does it's sort of these big gigantic movies like he did the Wizard of Oz prequel which yeah was all right and then he did a, a Marvel movie recently which I haven't seen which was like a sequel to Doctor Strange it seems like he loves horror movies I mean or he loves making them um, but he doesn't, hasn't went back. I mean, he's kind of said forever that he, that they might do another evil dead movie or that he would direct it. But I don't know. He, I think he says that anytime uh, he goes to one of these like fan events, Yeah, I wanted to dig back into 2009. He released a, his last horror film, uh, drag me to hell. I rewatched it last week. I saw the, uh, there's a theatrical version and a director's cut version. So I went with the director's cut version, which is a little bit harder uh, yes, are, it is. <laughs> it's much more disgusting in a good way. And if you haven't seen that, I highly recommend it. It's sort of him. It's really uh, Sam Raimi doing what he does best. And that's like creating tension, but also like you're having a lot of fun. There's some humor. There's some gross out moments. There's some really terrifying moments. And it's a very satisfying watch. And I'd forgotten how good that movie is. And it's really, you know, him... Uh, being a modern director, but also still utilizing all these little um, tricks of the trade that he picked up when he was, you know, a really young filmmaker. And that was a really great revisit. Um, I had so much fun. And it's there's still a couple moments in that movie that kind of freaked me out. And there's some very big callbacks to Evil Dead, too, in the Evil Dead series in that movie as well. So if you haven't seen Drag Me to Hell in a while, um, add that to your uh, watch list for October. If you've seen any of the Evil Dead series, you can see that it's all over Drag Me to Hell. But what I love about this movie in particular is that it's so much more involved story-wise, which just shows how much he's evolved and used from where he's come from to make something even on a grander scale. Yeah. And if you like Justin Long, who's now become sort of the, you know, an, an actor who is associated with horror movies because he's done so many now, um, a really funny role is the sort of husband who's trying to help but is also a little bit like skeptical he adds some humor to the movie there's so many moments in this that that are cause a physical reaction in me in like the best way that i that i want a horror movie to yeah the uh unrated version uh, i you know mentioned earlier with my wife mary um she did gag during the uh, yeah. unrated version <laughs> of drag me to hell so if uh you have a, a weak constitution you may want to watch the theatrical because there's not as much fluid and like like sort of like nasty gross sounds did you try to show this in your backyard or did I, you say that no, you, i did show it you yeah, did. Yeah. i can't believe that you did yeah i well and i hadn't i hadn't seen it in a while when we did that and then uh 
um, it was I was kind of shocked at how uh, <laughs> much grosser that director's cut was. I guess I've got one final thing. Uh, like I said, there's so many little nuggets about Evil Dead 2. The giant head, the giant apple head that we see right at the very end, the climax of the movie, um, that prop was left behind at, at the scene where they shot this. And as rumor has it, some local took it and put it in their own haunted house. I'm not sure how long that went on or even if it still exists. Um, but if there's any listener out there that knows where it exists or any fragment of it, anything like that, please let us know, because I want to know what happened to that thing. To have any relic from that movie would be pretty cool. Well, thank you so much for listening. I know we still have a ways to go before Halloween, but we wanted to put this episode out earlier in the month so we ourselves could enjoy the next several weeks of watching scary movies and watching the weather get a little bit cooler and seeing the leaves change. I love this time of year, and I also love, uh, you know, we're always real busy working, but getting home in the evening after I get the dog settled and curling up and watching a scary movie is just something that feels so great. I mean, I I love scary movies all year round, but this particular time when it gets a little bit cold and I've got the blanket on, um, there's nothing like it. So if that's something you enjoy, I hope you're able to have the time in October to really uh, take it in before it... uh, before it disappears. Justin, as as a horror movie lover and a dog lover, do you feel like Mallory, your dog, has become desensitized to the screams and noises that come out of horror movies? Because I feel bad sometimes for being Stan that they don't wake up. Yeah, at, like you know, in a in a fright. I still turn the volume down pretty quickly, but sometimes you just miss it, you know. Yeah, she doesn't. Uh, she doesn't really get affected by anything that I'm watching. If there's like screaming or dogs barking or anything, um, but at, recently she's gotten. She's older now, and so it's harder for her to, you know, get up and down the basement stairs where I'm usually watching movies in the podcast studio. And so uh, there's been a few nights recently where I was watching something that was kind of creepy and you know, I'm just down here in the dark by myself. Like she, or she'll uh, get up to leave halfway through a movie. And I'm like, wait, 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 where are you going? You know, (laughs) it's like, we're supposed to be doing this together. So it's not as creepy. Mallory, I feel like she would be a really good Michael Myers too for Halloween. Yeah. If you got her a Michael Myers outfit, she's already wearing the mask. She just needs a wig. Yeah. She's got that very stoic stare, Mm -hmm. but she loves it. When we do scary movies in the backyard, that's her favorite because she loves human company she's not as much of a dog lover as she just loves humans and she loves people coming over and you know dropping popcorn and uh being able to guard the outside area she loves uh like barking at stuff when we're out there sometimes Mm -hmm. it disrupts the movie but overall it it gives it makes for a more creepy atmosphere because you got a dog barking at the ominous darkness behind the screen like you don't know what's back there and you got two little ragamuffins that just follow her and bark after her yeah it's always a fun time yeah Well, again, enjoy the month of October. Have a happy Halloween. Uh, We'll see you back in November with Martin Scorsese's Underseen After Hours, which we've been talking about doing as an episode for a long time. Criterion finally put out a Blu-ray that had some extras on it, so we had some stuff to research, and we're really excited to get into that movie. Yeah, can't wait for that. Until next time, I'm Justin Johnson. And I'm Lindsay Reber. Thanks so much for listening. Happy Halloween, guys. 